This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our new and regular attendees to our webinar, How to Analyze Risks in Construction Projects. This is a novice or, and, or intermediate level presentation. Let's give you a go ahead on that. For those of you who are attending for the first time, my name is Michael Trumper. I'm one of the principals here at Endeavor Institute and I've been in the area of project risk analysis and management and software development for over 20 years. Before we start, I would just like to go over some of the housekeeping on how you can participate in the webinar. Up in the top right, you see a pane on your screen, which allow you to select the audio and also interact during the webinar. If you haven't done so, I recommend you using the computer mic and speakers as the audio quality tends to be better. Feel free to use the questions pane to ask questions during the webinar. Questions will be answered in the order that they came in at the end of the presentation. The webinar is going to consist of a few slides as and a demo of some of the methods discussed in the slides after that uh, we will be posting a recording over the next few days on our website construction projects are often over often behind schedule and over budget and is often a result of poor planning which can be a result of delusions or the unintentional mistakes of project planners due to motivational biases. These types of mistakes are most prevalent in smaller projects. For example, due to optimism bias, planners often think that a project has much less risk and can be completed faster and at a lower cost. In large projects, the source of cost and schedule overruns are often due to deception or the intentional attempt of project planners or sponsors to create plans that have reduced costs and duration with the goal of getting the project approved. This deception is often expressed as unrealistic reductions in the probability and impact of some risks and ignoring others. Why deception? Because it often, once a large project gets underway, it can often become too big to fail due to sunk costs. Political and reputational fallout in high profile mega project is considered worse than the fallout from shutting down a project. One of the solutions to reduce negative impact of these cognitive and motivational biases is project risk analysis. So here's a couple examples. The East Side project in New York City, very good example of how a degree of deception was at play. The goals of the project was to extend the Long Island Railroad from Queens into a new station under the Grand Central Terminal in Manhattan. The project's estimated cost has escalated from 4.3 billion in 1999 to 11.1 billion as of 2018, almost triple the original estimate and making it the most expensive construction project of its type in the world. Another classic example of where deception played a role in project overruns is the channel that linked the UK and France with an initial estimate of $2.6 billion at the, at the 1994 completion, actual costs were $4.65 billion. While some of the increased costs were due to design changes, due to safety, environment, and other concerns, a significant portion of the overrun has been attributed to deception. In addition, uh, we also see uh, we can also see projects where it's a combination of not de probably not deception or it might be self-deception where people are perhaps willfully ignorant uh, in ignoring potential risks. I would think that the Seattle's project to replace an aging infrastructure with approximately two mile tunnel uh, was is one of those. As they were drilling, it hit a major snag in 2013 when the world's largest boring machine, Big Bertha, 
stop working and need to be repaired. Repairs took about two years and required digging a giant hole in the middle of Seattle to retrieve the machine for repairs. So part of that is, I think they realize the risk is, but they probably, there was a little bit of wish or a lot of wishful thinking uh, in regards to what the impact of those, of what would happen if that uh, drill failed and needed repairing. Here in Calgary, uh, I think saner heads prevailed when a proposed plan to do a similar feat as in Seattle. In this case, a radial tunnel would have been run under the Bow River and part of the downtown to link up within existing lines. Uh, this would have been going uh, through obviously a densely populated municipal area along with the high water table. Uh, so perhaps with Seattle and some other sort of tunneling projects in mind, uh, this proposal was scrapped and a less risky alternative route was selected. So here we can see the major risks in the construction industry. How risk analysis is performed. To perform the risk analysis, we need two sources of information, a project schedule and a risk register. The risks are assigned with probabilities and impacts to different activities or resources in the schedule. Then Monte Carlo simulations are performed. The results are a statistical distribution of cost finish time, duration, other project parameters, as well as ranking risk in the risk register and sensitivity analysis. Project risk analysis for construction schedules involve, can involve an integrated analysis of project schedule and cost. And perhaps the simplest way, way is to use resource loaded schedules, which we'll take a look at later. So project risk analysis for competitive bidding, an accurate risk analysis is critically important during the competitor bidding. Construction companies should have a certain confidence level that will, they will complete the project within a schedule and budget. In this example, without risk, the project could be completed in 210 days. However, the P80 confidence level for completion is 282 days. So to meet the company's risk tolerance of P80, we'll require an additional 72 days of margin to account for the risk. Project owners are also seeing the value of project risk analysis, and it gives them the opportunity to assess risk-adjusted forecasts for project duration and cost prior to the bidding process and allows them to verify the feasibility of the bids they receive. When performing risk analysis, costs can be analyzed by assigning risk to resources. For example, if one subcontractor is less productive or having quality issues, this will affect all tasks which involve the subcontractor. Resource risk impacts can include duration, allocation, or resource rates, all of which can be impact both task duration and cost. So we'll take a look at that a little bit later when during the demonstration. So criticality index, it's a, it's a form of sensitivity analysis. Most construction schedules include many parallel paths. For deterministic project schedules, critical path method identifies one critical path through the schedule. In Monte Carlo simulations, a critical path calculation is performed at each iteration. Because each iteration can model different task durations, the results of the simulation can produce multiple critical paths. The criticality index indicates the frequency at which a task is on a critical path during the simulation. Tasks with a higher criticality index will most likely affect the project finish time the most. Finally, we could take a look at project controls. And in this, we're gonna take a look at the, how the project actuals, along with the expected forecast, given that project performance can be looked at and managed. The control process, it's a critical part of this project management. If, we could, if you can run a project risk analysis at each phase of the project, it helps to determine the forecast project completion dates while accounting for risks and uncertainties, as well as the actual duration of the completed portion of the project. And we can see here, there's the deterministic schedule. You see the low estimate, mean estimate, and the high estimate. And we can see right down at the bottom, 
where the actuals are there. And it's all just because we've already started to have a little bit of a slide. Uh, we've a uh, little bit behind schedule. It can start to create a forecast that's going to go well off to the right, much more so than if you'd been on time. So it does give us a very early warning of what the impact of that will be. This conference will now be recorded. We're now going to take a quick look at a uh, how we, some of the uh, some of the methods that we saw in there. Here is a project schedule. It has resources. Resources have rates, and by with the rates, we're going to end up having some costs. And we can actually see just on the deterministic schedule, it calculates those automatically. We can start to see the resource costs. Uh, unrisked that are on the on the baseline. Uh, we can see the overall right here. We've got this the current schedule, which is the baseline, and we can see it's a four point, you know, four million dollars uh, for this particular project unrisked. <clears throat> now, just so you know that if you ha do have a schedule, you can create it in in. Uh, risky project, but you can also import them from Microsoft Project XML format, Primavera piece, uh, XER format, MPX, which is another one that's a bit dated, but most scheduling engines, most scheduling tools, if you have, uh, e even if you don't have these two, uh, will support one of these formats that you'll be able to export and bring it into a risky project to do this sort of analysis. The other side of that is that we also want to be assigned risk to the system to do that risk analysis. I don't have any risk in the system because I just want to show you how we could bring them in. Uh, the first way that we can do them is we could just enter it in. Or this could be called procurement. We could add it in, in this way and we could create our lists as we identify them. If we ran a uh, risk workshop, we could st just start to add those and we can add information about the risks uh, in terms of who, what, when, how, our descriptions, all of those can come in. <laughs> or, uh, and you might have noticed earlier as I went through, we did have uh, risks from Excel. Uh, so we do have a, a, a fun function that we can import risks from Excel. It's a mapping. Uh, we do have information of that on our website. So I'm not going to go into it right now. I just wanted to let you know it was there. Uh, what I did want to look at is uh, one of the things that you can do um, is that we have risk templates and we have two types of risk templates. One is the risk assignments. Now risk assignments, and I'll load this in here. It's obviously a, 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 a list of your risks and these can be from a similar project. So if you have a, a similar construction project, that has very similar characteristics, you might be able to use these as a checklist. So it simplifies your uh, risk analysis and setting up your model because you'll have this list of previous risks. Uh, you may, some may or may not be appropriate. Uh, but on this one, uh, and you can t take them and you can add to it. Uh, the difference on these one is that actually also includes um, the risk assignment data that was used. The one thing that does not, that is changed is because risks are most likely going to be uh, assigned at the activity or resource level, um, that is not carried over because we don't know what the actual unique IDs for each activity are going to be and that's how we link them. Um, but it does give you a, an idea about how they were assigned uh, previously. Uh, so that's one way that we can do it. And you can export this out if I wanted to save, if I did have my risk assignments and done them, I could actually save this as a risk template for use in the future. Now I'm just going to clear this out. Uh, the other way, I've just got a, a simpler one that I'm going to use is a risk register. Now a risk register actually does the opposite. It doesn't have the risk assignments, but it has all the risk information in it. Uh, this one is very, this one I'm going to have very simple and hopefully it will load up very quickly. It's just a list of general risks that we have for construction projects. 
Uh, it doesn't include, if we look in here, it doesn't include risk assignments, but any of the data that's behind the scenes that we're being, uh, the who, who identified it, when it was identified, any sort of history or anything about that risks in that template will be brought over the sort of, I would call it the metadata uh, that we use for managing risk. So now we've had these risks in the system, we want to be able to assign them to uh, assign them to our uh, project. And what I really want to do is look at uh, <clears throat> ones, and we might say, here's a one that might be associated with a resource, uh, as we mentioned earlier. So one of the quick best ways to be able to assign these resources is we call it drag and drop risk and we can see we can we have a list of all the activities so if we wanted to assign risks from here on to the activities we could do that but we can also do it to resources and so one of the ways that we can do it from here here's the subcontractor I grouped all the subcontracts into one big subcontractor group for simplicity sakes and I'm going to grab that and drag it over to the subcontractor. Now what this is going to do, I'm gonna give it a relative delay because of this, this particular risk. And I think it's, there's, let's say there's a fairly high level of chant probability that will occur. And I'm gonna give it a triangular and I'll say it goes anywhere from zero uh, to five to 20, to 20%. So we've got this. Actually, let's just, we'll just make that almost uniform across the way. <clears throat> so we've created a triangular distribution. Now, if we look at that, and we'll just run a quick calculation on that, and we look at the analysis, and what we're seeing here is the impact of assigning that risk to this resource, because we haven't assigned anything else. We can see the cost on that. And we can see on the finish time, let's give this a little, uh, let's put the cumulative prob on there. Okay, we'll do the same here. So we want, we can look at the cost. Now, one of the things is if we look at that, so this is all being generated because we've assigned that risk to that, that one resource group. If we look at the statistical data for work, which is the amount of work being done by the resources, we'll actually see the uncertainty in the work is being driven by that subcon that resource. And these are very, very similar curves. And that's because the uncertainty in that particular resource in, in terms of duration about how long it will take to complete the work because of that risk is generating work, which is generating costs based on the resource costs. Uh, the resource rate. Now, we can also, if we look at this, we can also assign uh, risks. Uh, <clears throat> we can assign risk to uh, another one. And I'm just going to go in and, and say it is a, I call, I'm going to call it a rate risk, just in the, and the rate risk is uh, we're going to assign it to a resource and it just, what it will do, we'll put an uncertainty around what it will cost on a material resource. So if I go back to here and I'm going to go to resources and I'm, and right here we have this steel supplier. And so we have our a cost per use. We're going to, we're, we're going to apply a little bit of a risk to that simply here. We'll go to risks. And I was, let's see if we can find it here. Rate risk, there it is. There's the risk that we were going to do. And it's actually a spe specific type of outcome type. It's called a rate increase. Now, what we're going to say is that we think that there's a chance that it'll be zero to, and well, again, we'll just put a triangular zero to, five up to 20% increase 
on that steel, on that particular report. So on this cost, we've now created an uncertainty curve around that, so we can risk that. Um, we can do the same thing with the lumber supply as well. We'll put that risk and we will get that rate risk. And we'll pick up what I'd put in previously. Uh, we'll change this just to make a little bit more dramatic. And put that at 15%. And there we go. So now we've actually applied uh, risk and uncertainty to the cost of the materials. We've also put some uncertainty in terms of production. We, we think this sub, the subcontractor groups and all the ones it's assigned to are going to run. Maybe won't won't have as good a productivity because of of a risk. Um, we can also uh, assign uncertainties to the schedule. Now there's a two ways that we can assign uncertainty to the schedule. I'm not going to go, through, we can see how we can do it with risks, the other risks, but we won't do that right now. Uh, but we could assign uncertainty to a schedule by selecting all, and we could give it a, uh, a wristband. This is how we would calculate it based on that. Um, and that will update everything on there so we can see the yellow. Uh, or we could uh, put it in as a, an issue, as a risk. So we could say uh, we have an issue with 100% occurrence, and we could call it a, uh, often called, you know, uh, it's a schedule complexity, or it could be uh, aggressive scheduling, overly aggressive scheduling. But uh, we can put these uncertainties in either way, and that will then sort of fill in uh, the two types of risk that we have, we have uh, I call risk events and uh, resource rate risks, and we also have some uncertainty in how long it's going to take for each activity to occur. So we can run that, and we'll just run a quick calculation. And just on the calculation, we'll just hit this as well. So when we run that, uh, we can start to go back down into the analysis. Now, one of the things that when we do run an analysis on uh, critical path, uh, with critical path on Monte Carlo, if you have a very big schedule, it's going to cause uh, additional, uh, it, it takes additional time to do it, so it can slow it down quite a ways. So if you don't want to look at a criticality index, um, you might want to, if that's not one of the things that you want to put out. And we can go in here and we can show where the critical path is on the system. We can see that. So we run the critical path. Um, because we've actually got actuals in the system, uh, obviously these ones are not going to be. And we can see that by the green. Uh, they're not, but we can start to see the critical path here. We can add a criticality index into this view or, in, or any of the other analysis views. Uh, and there we start to see some of that criticality index coming in. Uh, so that's one of the things. The other alternative view, and I actually think uh, kind of like it a bit more, is the uh, which is is the cruciality. Cruciality tells us uh, it's, a, it's a sensitivity analysis and it's telling us and we have it as a sort of a uh, traffic light, uh, red, yellow and green I'm just gonna, on the schedule. And that's telling us which ones are most likely uh, activities are going to most likely land on the critical path or have which ones have the most potential. So what uh, activities in the schedule are these most sensitive to? Uh, changes to this. And this, I think, again, is a little bit more of a more accurate way to look at it because it's really, it's rather than the criticality index, we can actually see which activities visually here uh, we should be focusing our um, optimization efforts on because they're going to be, they're the ones that have the most impact on the project finish times and duration. The other thing that we brought up, and I, again, we talked about what happens when you've got uh, projects during execution. 
A lot of times we do see that a schedule risk analysis is done at the beginning of a project as part of the planning phase, and then we never, they don't, uh, it's not done again. It's not done on a regular basis. And we do recommend that probably at a, every major phase gate, you're going to do a schedule risk analysis, especially on big complex projects. And on this one right here, we can see that the we have some actuals in the system. Let's just go back and this is just showing a tracking view. And we can see that we have actuals 100% finished, complete. I'm just going to turn off the, uh, oh, I can't turn off the critical path there. Um, and we can see these have all been completed. And it started to push the schedule out a little bit because they're late. Again, this is the uh, results of the analysis and this is the original schedule. Uh, and we've we've already started to uh, from this one right here. We're already one, two, three. Uh, you know, almost almost uh, four weeks late. We had a late start, uh, and we've been falling behind ever since. We can see that here. And then when we look at the tracking chart again, and this is one what I find very powerful is that we're in here and we've lost about according to the actuals right now we've lost around about a week but what it's showing us up at the top here uh, if it'd gone up and we'd been on track this would mean dramatically shifted over this way but now we can see that we're the chance that we're going to make uh, that we're going to be on on schedule to the deterministic very very low little a little slippage here equals a big slippage up here. So good thing about these things, again, is that if we can run it once we've got, we're one or two months into the schedule, project execution, it's gonna give us a really good early warning about what the possible uh, impacts of that changes to that schedule might be, or changes to your possible outcomes might be in your, in your, in your, in your, in, in being able to sorry finish your project on time again very uh can be quite powerful way to uh look at it and and it can be used in conjunction with a, an earned value analysis to say yes we knew that earned value will give us a linear regression based on past performance if you're moving into a part of the schedule that might have additional complexity, harder execution, uh, more risk, uh, that's where earned value, that regression analysis that it used tends to fail because it doesn't, uh, the reality is it's giving you a line and it's not taking into account the future risk and uncertainties that you have in the system. So with that, just going to go back to our plan and we can finish up there. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them right now. I don't see any in right now. Uh, we do have a book out that covers a lot of this. It's called Project Risk Analysis Made Ridiculously Simple. Uh, it's uh, published by World Scientific. Uh, you can see information of that on our on our site as well as uh, on amazon.com or any of the other sort of uh, booksellers. Uh, again, uh, it includes this information and gives you some good idea about how to set up your project uh, risk analysis for your construction projects. Um, thank you very much for your time and look forward to um, hearing from you in the future.